Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. Later in the show, going to be interviewing David Owen from Legalize North Dakota. They've released some details about uh, what they expect to be a, a ballot measure that they're going to circulate for signatures to put on the next statewide ballot, or not the next one, the next one's in June of next year, probably the November ballot, but anyway, they're going to circulate the uh, petitions, they're going to put this issue on the ballot, and their new measure is significantly different from the one that they proposed in 2018. So we'll get all into all the details about that a little bit later in the show, but before we get there, let's talk about what's going on with the auditor. Now, earlier this week, Attorney General Wayne Stengem issued an opinion saying that it, essentially, uh, what, what the legislature had passed with regard to the, the state auditor, and if you'll remember, if you've been listening to the show, if you've been following the story on SayAnythingBlog.com, what lawmakers did at their legislative session earlier this year is they passed uh, the inserted language into the state auditor's budget, and they did it in a sneaky way. They did it right at the end of the legislative session. They did it in what's called a conference committee, which is essentially a committee uh, – that, that is formed between the House and Senate chambers to hammer out the, the, the final changes to, to bills so that each chamber can agree to them and, and send the bills on to the governor for signature. They snuck into one of these, these bills through a conference committee uh, an amendment to the auditor's budget, which forces the auditor to go begging to the, the, uh, a legislative committee. It's called the Legislative Audit and Fiscal Review Committee to go begging to this committee for permission to perform performance audits. Now, many, including this humble observer, felt that that was an an inappropriate limitation on the auditor's authority. Attorney General Wayne Sengem came out, and obviously it's not his place to necessarily comment, in, in this capacity anyway, to necessarily comment on the efficacy of the policy, but he commented on its legality. And he said that if this if this part of the budget ended up getting challenged in the courts, it would almost be certainly be struck down by the state Supreme Court based on Supreme Court precedent set by an earlier lawsuit where the legislature sued Governor Doug Burgum over executive powers. So that's an interesting situation. And it gets all the more interesting because today we learn that the legislature is going to abide by the ruling. Now, the legislature doesn't have to abide by the ruling. The, the legislature doesn't necessarily have to do what the attorney general tells them. That's the whole separation of powers thing. The attorney general has issued an opinion, but the legislature is free to disregard that opinion. And certainly they did in that previous case I, I told you about where the legislature sued Governor Burgum. Uh, and, and Governor Burgum, you know, basically the, the, the state Supreme Court came in and, and told both Burgum and the legislature that they were overstepping their bounds. Burgum with some of his line item vetoes, the legislature with some of the authority that they were delegating to interim committees. So... The legislature had doesn't have to abide by what the attorney general says, but now they're saying that they will. State Senator Rich Wardner said, I quote, and I'm, I'm quoting here from a, a Forum News Service article published in the Grand Forks Herald. He says, I quote, will abide by the ruling. He said that they never intended to hinder Auditor Josh Gallion. That, that's our current auditor, Josh Gallion. They, they never intended to hinder his work. Now, that's pretty remarkable for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, they absolutely intended to hinder his work. Absolutely intended to. That was the whole point of the exercise. If you listen to the way the politicians are talking, what they go out and say is that the auditor was was getting too big for his britches. Those are things that I've heard members of the state legislature tell me, that he was overstepping his bounds, that he was sensationalizing things, 
They just don't like the auditor. They don't like his approach to the job, which is too bad because I think Josh Gallion is a breath of fresh air. I think his approach to the auditor's office is aggressive. I think it's fair. I think he's doing a great job. So here we are. But what's what's interesting even more is is Wardner saying that, that they're going to abide by the ruling because not so long ago in a column, in fact, just last month on June 7th, in a column published on sayanythingblog.com, among elsewhere, Senator Rich Wardner wrote that the legislation passed was exclu- explicitly constitutional. Here's, I'm going to quote from his column. He wrote, I quote, This action by the legislature was wholly appropriate and necessary. The North Dakota State Constitution states that the powers and duties of the state auditor come from the legislature. Therefore, the legislature has oversight of the auditor and auditor and makes decisions on staff requests, length, length of audits, and the quality of all audits, including performance audits. The audits are critical to the legislature because the audits help the legislature make sound policy. Then he goes on and he cites the North Dakota Constitution and he cites the North Dakota Century Code. But the thing is, the attorney general just came out and smacked all that down said, no, if this went before the courts based on precedent set by a lawsuit filed by the legislature, by the way, based on all of that, the state Supreme Court would almost certainly strike down this, this restriction on the auditor's authority is unconstitutional. So I think Senator Wardner, I think every single member of the legislature who voted For this thing, they've all got egg on their faces. And by the way, somebody who also has egg on their face is the person who the legislature sued over executive power. That's Governor Doug Burgum. Burgum won some victories in that lawsuit. Governor Burgum went to bat and he protected executive power and he won some victories. He also got smacked down a little bit himself, exercising his veto power. But on the whole, it was a win for the executive branch. But who signed this bill, this auditor bill, into law? Well, Governor Burgum did. He signed it into law. And he defended signing it into law. And now the Attorney General has said that it's unconstitutional based on a precedent that essentially his office won. You got to make you wonder, why why was Governor Burgum so inconsistent in his defense of executive branch authority? And was it because the auditor took a look at his travel records after remember that XL Energy debacle where it came to light that Governor Burgum had, had accepted uh, what amounted to essentially tens of thousands of dollars worth of uh, uh, travel arrangements um, for for a, a trip to the the Super Bowl in Minnesota paid for by XL Energy, a, a, a gigantic uh, energy company, uh, a, a utility company that operates in our state that's always building wind farms and doing all these other things and lobbying the legislature, lobbying the state government aggressively. The auditor, after that broke, after that broke in the news, the auditor took a, a, a long look at Governor Burgum's travel records and the fact that the auditor was looking into it made headlines. Now, the auditor ended up not finding anything all that interesting or, or, or scurrilous that was going on in the Burgum administration, which doesn't surprise me because generally, I, although I think uh, taking that XL Energy trip was a poor choice, generally, I think Doug Burgum's an honest guy and I don't think he would be doing anything untoward with taxpayer resources. But hey, the auditor checked it out. He didn't. The, the most he found, I think you could say, is maybe there should be some better reporting requirements for some of the travel. But no real abuses, no real problems. But I, I think it stung Governor Burgum that the auditor took a look at that, and I think Governor Burgum signed this law as a sort of punitive swipe back at the state auditor, and now it's blown up in his face. I, I'm glad that, that Attorney General Wayne Syndrome had the integrity to come out and call it like it was, say that this, this law is no good. It's unconstitutional. And, and even if it wasn't, Right. And, and, and perhaps we could even still have a debate about whether it's unconstitutional or not. The courts haven't weighed on, in on it. This is just the attorney general's opinion. It's not binding in any real way. But I do think I do think that what's been revealed here is a there is a good argument to make that the law is, in fact, unconstitutional. And also, even if it is unconst- isn't unconstitutional, even if it's perfectly legal, a perfectly legal exercise of the legislature's authority, they shouldn't have passed it in the first place. I'm going to be writing more about this at sayanythingblog.com. Check it out. My interview with David Owen coming up next.
This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Joining me now is David Owen. He is one of the organizers behind Legalize ND. You saw him a lot during the last, the 2018 election cycle because he was the one out there telling you to vote for Measure 3, which was a ballot measure to legalize recreational marijuana in North Dakota. Now, North Dakota voters didn't go for it. Uh, instead, North Dakota voters um, rejected it. And one of the, the complaints about it that, that many had is that it was it was too vague, which I, I think maybe, David, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong. I took that to mean in other ways that, that maybe it wasn't specific enough. I, I mean, obviously not specific enough, but I, I think what they're saying is that the language was too broad. It was too broad a legalization. They wanted something much, voters seem to want something much more limited, which is why I'm having you on the show today, because you now have a new proposal, which is much more limited. I mean, you have a lot more restrictions in here that simply weren't in measure three and we'll get to those in a minute, but is that, is that your sense? That's what the voters wanted. They wanted something more limited. What we thought is voters were concerned that we were putting a lot of trust in the legislature to create a framework and structure. And so as a result, we've decided that instead of letting the legislature create the framework around measure three after it passes, we'll create a complete proposal that basically tells everyone how the whole system is going to work and moves it forward in the way that we think is most effective. Now, one thing that, but before we get into the specifics of what you're proposing now, I'm reading my colleague John Hageman's article about this, and under all the different bullet points, he says, because you're working with the with the defense attorney, Scott Brand, uh, and I know Scott, he's a great attorney, and, and he's helping you put together some of this language and make sure that it's workable with existing state law, and it's it's going to do all the things that, that we think it's going to do if, if we end up voting for this. One thing he's saying is that he's still working on final wording about expunging marijuana convictions. I was surprised to read this because when I had you on the podcast previously, we had talked and you said that was something that, that wasn't going to be in a, a new measure. So, but but here, we, here we are, and it, it sounds like you're going down the expungement road again. So we reexamined our public opinion research that we did, and what we found is people were not ex- um, opposed to the theory of expungement. They had been opposed to the implementation once we did further research. People didn't want drug dealers and very heavy hitters, so to speak, getting their records expunged. But they really did want to see people with small and petty possession have their records expunged. So that's actually why it's late, is because we decided to do it after we did our research and found that the people do want expungement. They just want expungement only for small level use. Tell me about this research. You did you did like polling. I mean, what 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 did you do to come to this conclusion? So we had three different types of research. The first type of research was we had simple feedback from our initial core supporter group. I mean, it went about as well as you'd expect. Um, then we had feedback from the general public over a three-month period. Um, I don't know if you remember, but we submitted. We had like 50 different questions on the website that we wanted people to answer sure. and get their thoughts on. That was the second form of feedback. And the third way we did feedback is we had some po- uh, polling that we're keeping kind of close to our best. And that was kind of fueled from the research we did and how people responded to the questions. Okay. Well, I mean, that's that all sounds reasonable. I, I will tell you, I was very I, – I, I thought the expungent – expungement provision was I, I supported measure three in 2018 i think we absolutely need to legalize marijuana i worried about the expungement provision being a stumbling block because a i think voters find it confusing and and usually nuance in in ballot measures isn't isn't doesn't go over if you're explaining you're dying basically in in, in the po- in politics in general in the politics of ballot measures specifically but b i think a lot of people just felt why are we giving what whatever our laws are going to be going forward why do we want to give a free pass to people who violate them and violated the law in the past i I don't know i mean even if you narrow down the expungement provision and and make sure that it's it's you know we're, we're focusing on you know petty offenders and not 
you know, cartel people or, or drug traffickers or people like that. I, I still don't know that there's a lot of appetite for expungement, and I'm worried that that's the hill that this measure is going to die on. But what we see is there's a huge appetite for it. It's why uh, it's one of the parts of marijuana reform that Shannon actually got done successfully was expanding the existing expungement programs. Um, there is a huge appetite. When, when you, and when you, when you say rest- Shannon, I want to make sure that that, sh- that State Representative yeah, Shannon Representative Moore Jones, Roar Jones from from uh, from Fargo, and we had a debate about. And, and she, I mean, she had to work very hard in the state legislature to get it passed. In fact, her original bill was killed; it had to be brought back as an amendment to another bill. Uh, but but she did. She she got that but, through. They, they called but it the record sealing bill. Okay, which was a separate bill. Rob got through very easily. Yeah. Okay. There, there is a big appetite in this state for the sealing of some records. And in fact, that's one of the things that we heard people who were kind of against it. They said, look, if this gives my kid a second chance, I'll hold my nose and vote for it. But I'm not going to vote for it if it also gives the guy selling 500 pounds a second chance. I'm not sure that I agree. I think you're right. I think there is an appetite in the state for... For, for some sort of a, for instance we passed a law related to this we, we passed a law on sealing DUI records after a set number of years I think it was something like seven years uh, we passed a law on getting rid of the checkbox on past convictions on applications for state jobs I mean we, we have been moving down and, and I like that I like the idea of redemption I'm just worried putting this on the statewide ballot the opposition's going to come out law enforcement's going to come out wh- whoever it is that, that's going to come out against your measure and they're going to say and oh by not only are, is this parade of horribles going to happen if we legalize marijuana and any recreational marijuana to any degree at all, but also we're going to give criminals a, a pass. I, I just don't know. That's a tough thing to overcome rhetorically when you're out on the campaign trail. I, I can see that. I agree. I disagree with you, um, okay. honestly. I think when you talk about it, you go, these aren't criminals. These are kids that made a mistake. Sure. These and I, and I agree with 20s. you. I mean, I, I, I want to tell you, I don't, I don't endorse that position I just described. I just think there's a lot of voters who are going to feel that way. I, I don't think there are. I think it's very hard in this state to find someone who doesn't at least know one person who got a paraphernalia or possession charge that has hurt them getting a job today. Yeah. That's fair. Let's talk about some of the other things you're changing. Rundown. I mean, I'm, I'm reading in the John Hageman article. And by the way, I have it. Uh, I'm sure you can find it on uh, the various news websites. I have it linked at sayanythingblog.com. There is a whole list of bullet points, um, and I'm just going to run through these. There's going to be a possession limit right now, the way it's currently formulated, uh, where you're not allowed to have two, more than two ounces of marijuana at a time. You can't have it in an open container or a passenger area of a vehicle, so no driving around with a dube in your ashtray uh, smoking. Do cars even have ashtrays anymore? I, I don't even know. The car I drive I mean, mine old. does. Yours does? Okay. Well, I guess some people still – I guess that's still a thing. Um, you, no sales to people under 21 years of old ban on growing marijuana for personal use. Instead, it's all got to be through like commercial state regulated facilities to produce a safe product. Uh, existing penalties would remain in place for people driving while impaired by marijuana, uh, selling or delivering marijuana to people under 21 would become a, a class, a misdemeanor, uh, cities could reject and limit retail stores in their communities. Uh, no person could have more than one ounce in their home unless it was secured by a lock to prevent, uh, you know, kids accessing and underage kids accessing it or, or toddlers or babies getting into it accidentally. Uh, a person could consume marijuana in a public place or smoke marijuana where tobacco is prohibited. Workplaces could still enforce policies restricting consumption of marijuana by employees. So if you're if you're if you're if where you work still has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to drug use. It being legal is is not uh, is not going to help you. Uh, we would also create a, a marijuana commission, uh, three members appointed by governor the, the governor. Um, they would have licensing authority and be the sole regulatory authority over marijuana retail stores and manufacturers. Uh, we'd also have a ten member marijuana advisory board to make recommendations on the regulation of marijuana accessories. Uh, marijuana and accessories. Uh, sellers or stores would be required to test marijuana products to prevent contaminants that could be injurious. Uh, edible products would be allowed but would have to be in child-resistant containers. Uh, and they cannot contain additives designed to make the product more appealing to children. Any advertising or marketing uh, could not target people under 21. There would be an excise tax of 10% on retail products. Uh, 
It would be charged at the point of sale with stores required to file monthly forms and payments to the state. Uh, so that's going to generate some revenues. I, I imagine revenues that would then be used could be used to, to, to I, I guess, pay for some of this new bureaucracy. And then finally, well, yeah, speaking to that very point, all tax revenue from sales would first be al- allocated to sustain the commission. Excess tax ra- revenues would be allocated 50% to the general fund, 10% to health and human services for use in addiction treatment programs, 10% to the Department of Education, 10% to the Legacy Fund, 10% to the North Dakota Parks and Recreation Commission, and 10% to Department of Commerce for workforce development. So, um, yeah, yeah there, there it is. It. There it is. Can you give can you give us the thinking behind all this? So one of the big things was people were concerned that kids would get it. So step one, how do we make sure kids can get it? Well, I don't know a kid that can knowingly get through a lock and then get through a childproof container, as in your average kid. I don't know any average kid that has the skills required to get through good old master lock and then the childproof container Yeah. in a timely manner. So now kids aren't going to get it. Number two concern was gummies and certain types of edibles are marketed to children. Fine. Can't market them to children. And if you're found to be marketing them to children, there will be disciplinary actions. So that's a key thing. The next one was, well, we're concerned that it's just going to be a bunch of really shady people opening these stores. Okay, fine. You can't have had distribution and manufacture in the past five years. Or ever, I think, for distribution and manufacture. I think possession is five years. So you can't, it can't be the drug dealers all open up marijuana shops. Yeah. Some stores are like, well, I'm not opposed to Fargo having it, but me in uh, Buxton, I don't want it. Okay, fine. You don't have to have it in Buxton. You just have to let the people in Fargo have it. Buxton can say no. It was basically designed to systematically address and target every single one of their complaints. Um. And I just want to make one clarification. The smoking in public would not be allowed um, if tobacco wasn't allowed there. I think you misspoke when you read it. Oh, I, I may maybe have. I misheard you. I may, I may, I may, well, I may have misspoke, but uh, good good to clarify that. Hey, let me ask you about the advertising thing because I, I know this is a big thing. We, we do it already with, with the, the alcohol industry. We do it with the tobacco industry where you're not allowed to target kids. But, but some of that, I mean, that, that seems like a very hard thing to quantify because – we live in an era where grown-ups watch cartoons and play video games, right? I, I mean, this, yeah. let's. I mean, let's face it. Grown-ups, th- thirty, forty years. Old, I play video games. Um, there are there are cartoons that are uh, targeted towards adults. I mean, adults go for that sort of thing, and so something that may, maybe in another era, if it had like a card, like like Joe Camel, right? Kind of famously was an example of the tobacco industry creating a cartoonish mascot that, that, you know, many argued was intended to target young children and get them hooked on, on smoking. And, and maybe it was, I, I don't know. But I mean, in, in an era where, where adults are, you know, very much into, it, we live in a different era. I mean, adults are, are reading comic books and watching cartoons. How, how do you quantify What's targeting adults and what's targeting children in that context? I think this is where you go back to the Supreme Court's ban on pornographic speech. And the justice of the Supreme Court kind of said it really well. I know it when I see it. (laughs) I hate that standard, by the way. Um, But I I guess you're right. That's that's the legal standard that we have, unfortunately. And you're right. It's hard to create an objective standard. But that's why, if you'll notice, no two people on that commission can be of the same political party. Yeah. You'd have to get a Democrat, a Republican, and presumably a Libertarian to all agree at targeted children. Yeah, that's a hard ask if it's not targeting children. That's that's true. Um, let me I, the, the partisan makeup thing. I did think was a little odd too. I mean, I, how how are we going to find? I mean, do, do, what constitutes a Libertarian? I mean, a lot of people view me as a Libertarian. A lot of people also view me as a Republican. I haven't paid dues to any particular pol- political party. I think the last time I made a donation was to Republicans in like 2006. I have generally very libertarian social views. Would I, where, where would I fall on the political spectrum? Do I have to so, join a political party? No, basically what it would be is if you're independent, you're not a member of a political party. What it was designed to prevent is from Governor Burgum saying, okay, I'm going to appoint Senator Judy Lee and Attorney General Wayne Stenton to this board, and I'm going to throw Representative Pam Anderson on it. It forces him to pick people outside of the political spectra okay. in a lot of ways. 
because you can't argue that Wayne Stendham is not a Republican. Yeah. You can't argue that Gretchen Dobervich is not a Democrat. I think they're both very proud of what they are. Yeah. Um, and so it's designed to make it such that people outside the political spectrum are the ones you can pick. So basically, if you're not currently holding elected office, you, you, you're, you're good and to haven't go? haven't held it in the reasonable past. Okay. That seems a little nebulous, but okay. Um, and, and then the other thing, I, I did think it was interesting, too, some of your provisions about saying, I, I actually kind of like that we're only going to allow marijuana sold through regulated. I think that this is something that the vaping industry has struggled with, that it was sort of the Wild West, and so there was no uniformity of product. Right. So there was no like like you could use one vaping juice and like the, the the nicotine dose you get could be enormous and another one, it could be much smaller. And I think that created problems for users because they didn't necessarily know what they're getting. I think the provisions in this ballot measure, although they make the libertarian in me cringe a little bit, this is the, still very much the Wild West for this industry. I, I think it's going to be a lot easier for the public to adopt it. If this stuff is being sold in a way where consumers can say, I know what I'm buying. I understand if I buy this brownie or if I buy this marijuana and I use it, I know what I'm getting and I can, I can, you know, uh, I could prepare for, for the sorts of effects that it's going to have on me and, and use it responsibly. I, I think, I think that's going to help a lot. I do too. And I agree. It makes the libertarian and me personally cringe, but. They didn't want the libertarian bill. Yeah, they didn't want the libertarian bill. The libertarian bill got uh, got tossed. So w- when can we expect? Because it, it sounds like you're still finalizing it. Why did you come out with all this now? I mean, usually usually we we don't hear about ballot measures until they get filed with the Secretary of State's office. But you're out, you know, talking about specifics, um, kind of a, ahead of the curve. Uh, two reasons. The first is transparency. Okay, we want everyone to know what we're doing, especially. In something like this, we don't want to be seen as shady or ill repute or any of that. We want everyone to know from the very beginning what we're doing, how it evolves, what it looks like the whole way through. Step two is to kind of crowdsource input again. Um, This is more on the legal side, but I can't afford 30 attorneys. And Scott is a wonderful attorney, but let's pretend Scott or I missed something. And Representative Roars Jones or Lloyd Omdahl or Nodland or one of them find something that we wrote that's really dumb would be nice if they told us before we put it on the ballot. Well, and, and I guess I guess rhetorically you can go back and say, well, uh, this was out there. You knew what was coming. Why didn't you speak up? So I, I think that's yeah. I think that's fair. Uh, the other thing uh, Hageman's article mentions, obviously, there's there's another pro marijuana group in our state, and they're working towards their own sort of legalization. They're proposing a constitutional amendment that would constitute a very broad legalization of of recreational marijuana. They're they're saying essentially that they don't see a problem that that the two measures could be on the same ballot and if both passed it's no big deal. But I'm not sure that's true because if they they withdrew their previous measure, but if 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 they go back to the Secretary of State and they get a new measure that's the same creates the same sort of broad right to use marijuana, it's absolutely going to conflict because you're putting in place all sorts of restrictions on people's ability to to grow it and to use it and to sell it and everything else where they're creating a right to all of those things. They're absolutely going to be in conflict. If if these two things pass at the same time, we're going to have a problem because I think their their amendment... We aren't going to have a problem in the event that two things are sufficiently similar. um, The Secretary of State can make a ruling and state that the one that got the higher vote percentage supersedes. Okay. Last I checked. In the event there are two legally conflicting measures, the one that gets the higher percentage of the vote wins. Okay. Assuming they're on the same ballot. Well, I, I guess but, we'll find out. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, I guess I'm not sure how all that would play out. I'm, I'm not sure that that process is as cut and dried. Uh, and I have a feeling we we might end up in court if if something like that were to happen. Have you talked? I mean, you're 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 saying essentially. I, I'm I'm reading that where you told John that. Um, they're essentially working towards different goals. Can you tell me what you mean by that? I, I think I've been very clear on your show numerous times, my okay. thoughts on that group. What I'll simply say is they're trying to relitigate a failed measure. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, David, thanks for your time. Thank you, Rob.
That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes come out most weekday mornings. Uh, if you want to subscribe to this podcast, there's all sorts of platforms out there. If you're not listening, if you're just listening to this on the web browser, um, you know, I, I post all the new audio at sayanythingblog.com. That's certainly one way to follow the podcast. But there's all sorts of easier ways. The podcast is in Spotify. It's on pretty much every podcasting app that's out there, Stitcher, what have you. So if you want to listen that way, uh, those are, uh, trust me, much easier ways to follow the podcast. You can also follow me on social media. Just search for Rob Porter, Say Anything Blog on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, You can send me emails if you've got feedback on the show. If you've got questions for our weekly guests, uh, Senator Kevin Kramer, Congressman Kelly Armstrong, email those to rob at sayanythingblog.com. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We'll talk again.